Welcome to the GamesNet Berlin Europe podcast. Here, we speak with extraordinary games industry professionals and listen to their story to learn all about what they've built and who they are. GamesNet Berlin Europe is the international games industry initiative of MediaNet Berlin Brandenburg, the networking association for the media, creative and digital industries in Germany's capital region. My name is Simon Oller and I will be your host for this program. Today, I'm speaking with Rami Ismail. Rami is a Dutch-Egyptian indie game developer and ambassador. He's the co-founder of Flambeer, the studio with which he developed games like Nuclear Throne and Ridiculous Fishing. He also developed PressKit, a free online tool for indie developers to market their games to the press. He's a seasoned conference speaker and received the 2018 Game Developers' Choice Ambassador Award for his fostering work in international regions where game developers face more resistance. Rami is also a host of the podcast The Habibis. In part one, that's what you're listening to right now, we speak about Rami's career, his beginning as a games developer and how he started out as a modder in games like StarCraft. How he went to school for games development but dropped out due to ownership issues. How he founded, built and shut down Flambeer across a 10-year period and why that was foretold and what it has to do with his co-founder. And also what receiving the award at GDC meant for him and his career. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast to also find part two of this episode. In part two, we go over Rami's personal life, how he grew up between two cultures, how that drives him to bring more cultural sensitivity in the gaming space, and what that means for his next endeavor after Flambeer has come to an end. Please enjoy my conversation with Rami Ismail. Hello, good day, Rami, and welcome to the show. Hi there. Yeah, glad to be here. Very nice to have you. You are very well known as a indie game pioneer, I would say, um, <laughs> speaker, advisor, and right. uh, wanted to get right in, into it and ask you uh, how you get started as what you are known as and um, how you landed in this role. Right. I mean, it's kind of a two part, like it's kind of a two part story, right? I wanted to be a game developer when I was growing up. And I wanted to be a game developer because when I was six years old or something, my dad brought home uh, a work computer. It was a hand me down from an uncle, I think. And it came with MS DOS. And I was just immediately fascinated by the device, even though I, I didn't really understand any of it. So. After some messing around and learning enough uh, commands, because I, I didn't speak English, obviously, learning enough commands, I ended up finding QBasic, and QBasic contained a tutorial game called Gorillas, and I played that a lot with my sub with my siblings and loved it. And one day I got curious as to what all the the letters on the screen were, the code I would learn later. And uh, scrolled through it and found the menu text and replaced that with my name. And I ran the code anew. And now Gorilla showed my name. And the idea that you can change a video game, something that you enjoy by changing letters on a computer, that idea, I think, took hold in my mind. I love this. And it's amazing. Never let go. Right. Yeah. So that that's how it started, and over the next decade and a bit, um, or two decades almost, no, a decade and a half, I'd say, over the next decade and a half, up until I was about 18 years old, I spent a lot of time modding. I modded StarCraft. I uh, modded, you know, back in the days when games were usually shipped with plain text files that defined units or characters or anything. It was it was very easy to to mod and modify things. So I started by messing around with plain text data files, then got into modding, level editing, um, eventually got into working on uh, somebody else's game, as uh, sort of support feedback, a uh, little bit of help here and there with actually creating stuff, and then from there ran some of my own projects all of them filled miserably obviously like way too big in scope i made every teenager mistake you could possibly think of too big in scope team un uh, unreliable team didn't manage to lock down a design or an interesting core mechanic 
did some, How old were you then when you made these mistakes? <laughs> probably 16, 17 years old. Okay. Okay. Um, but at that part where I was switching to actual game development, I would say, right, in the point where I was switching from modding stuff to making stuff. Uh, not to say that modding isn't making, but there's a, there's kind of a difference between having a foundation and having nothing, right? Yeah, it's not zero to one, right? Right. Like modding is wonderful because it's sort of an expression of how can we use slash misuse the available tools to create something interesting and wonderful and special and curious. And the act of game development is similar, but it starts from a different point and it ends at a different place, right? Yeah. So, can I ask you ask you one question about modding? Yeah, sure. You had me uh, uh, my ears open at uh, StarCraft because um, I really like StarCraft, and I was wondering what you what you modded there in StarCraft. Oh, I'm so I did a lot of stuff. I mean, I did the basics, right? Like unit replacement, creating units, and I did a lot of map editing. Uh, the map editing was probably my favorite part because the map editor that came with StarCraft was so incredibly powerful. Um, I even made years ago, and I, this makes me laugh every time I think about it, I made a map where you control a single hero unit with abilities that you know spawn units or things with three lanes that go top, middle, and bottom even though i didn't call it that way and you could evolve your character by defeating enemies and every side had sort of a king character um so when i saw when i saw dota and and the moba uh, sort of surge i i thought well you know i was at the wrong time at the wrong at the wrong place mine was definitely not as good as those games ended up being but the the overall concept of MOBA of MOBAs was definitely sort of in design space for a very long time already. I, I was definitely not the only person that made maps like that. Yeah, uh, I saw tower defense uh, as as a fun exercise. Those were really fun to make. Or sunken defense. Uh, these big maps where multiple players try to defend sort of a central location. Yeah, uh, yeah. I had a lot of time. I made my own campaign. Um, it was fun. It was really. Would you fun. say that StarCraft was like a, as a developer, a f foundational thing for you? Yeah, I think StarCraft was. I mean, the games, mm. the games that I remember most messing around with most were Urban Assault, which was this 1995 Windows game by Terra Tools, I think, in in uh, Germany, and. It was this weird mix of a real-time strategy game and an action game. You would build units, and then you could control those units in first person. And I thought it was the coolest thing. But all their data was plain text. So modifying that, making vehicles go like six times as fast, trying to figure out how the data structures work, that was probably the game that gave me most insight into how a game was structured, right? The idea of assets being separate from data being separate from sort of the structures that read them uh, that was the game that sort of thought taught me that and then starcraft probably taught me about um probably taught me about you know the sort of design that goes into making a level because up until that point you just go like oh you put some bricks in a mario level and then it's a mario level and starcraft really forced me to think about Action, reaction, trigger, uh, response, um, how players move, what players do, what players know, what they don't know, how to make that fun and interesting. So, yeah, I would say StarCraft was pretty big uh, for awesome. me. Yeah, I love right. that game. Yeah, me too, man. It was very foundational for me too, but uh, in other ways, more like economics and like understanding strategy and stuff. So. Right. And it was StarCraft 2 for me, but uh, and competitive too. All, all that was like nice. so. I'm glad uh, for the uh, that we can nerd out over that. Um, <laughs> back to the story. You're 16, 17. You you said you're making all these mistakes. Right. Um, what's what's happening? What's going on? So yeah, I'm making all these mistakes, and uh, basically, I'm learning what not to do. Right. Which right. it didn't feel that great back at that time. I remember I was feeling pretty down about my my ability to actually create stuff. But every now and then, I would release something that I was happy with. I wasn't proud of it, but it was at least, you know, it felt like an achievement to get it out there. 
and I was working along in these games by another developer that I enjoyed working on as sort of like a sidekick, I guess. And um, yeah, eventually I, I kind of was presented with the choice, right? I was done with high school and I had to figure out where to go study. And in my research, I found that there were schools that actually taught game design, which was honestly shocking to me. I thought it was more of a dream that an actual career somebody could have. Um, and I will say I was probably also pretty demotivated that I had never come across anybody that was named like me, right? I, you know, it was all cool English names, but definitely not a Rami Ismail in there anywhere. Mm. Uh, so it just it just never came up, right? My my dad, being Egyptian, always taught me that I was going to be a doctor, a lawyer, or, or an engineer. Uh, the 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 Egyptian word uh, Um which is sort of like a high ranking engineer. That was sort of my nickname growing up, right? Besmohandas Rami. So for me, the idea of game development as a career was shocking, but I I enrolled anyway. Um, ended up some paperwork went wrong. I ended up being a computer salesman uh, for a few years um, as the paperwork got fixed, and then after a year of being only a, a you know full time computer salesman and doing some game development at night. I enrolled at the Utrecht School of Art and Technology in Hilversum, the Netherlands. And uh, I loved it. It was great. The the whole, you know, suddenly you're in a culture of people that are like you, that love video games, that have been tinkering with video games, that, you know, have a history with games, that talk about games the same way you do, that think about games the same way that you do. And it was as a kid who grew up between two cultures, between the Dutch and Egyptian identity, I was too Dutch to be Egyptian, too Egyptian to be Dutch. It was probably the first time I felt home. Amazing. Right. Finding your tribe, a beautiful moment. Right. It was big for me. It was, it was, it was a big moment and it was something I cherish to, that, to this day that I, that I went to that school and got to know all these people. For sure. And how did uh, Flam Beer come about was that at this time or was that later it was about this time so the first year of that university was great i loved it i learned so much and i, I was put into a lot of um play like in a lot of disciplines i had to do a lot of things that i was just not good at right i'm not a great drawer i i know my photoshop i know my way around making basic art i'm not a good i'm not a good artist i'm not a good musician I can tell you when something sounds right to me or when it sounds wrong, and I can kind of discuss it in terms that make sense to actual composers or audio designers, but I can't compose something for the life of me, right? But school forced me to engage with all of those things in a very serious manner and forced me to sort of think about these disciplines as full disciplines instead of as assets or resources, right? To me, that was huge, and I loved it. But then the second year came around, and in the second year, a problem occurred because the school switched curriculum in the transition between my first and second year, which meant that the second year was actually relatively undefined. I don't think the school really knew what they were doing, and we ended up just getting taught a lot of the same things that we had already learned in the first year. And for somebody who'd been making games since you know we was six. I was already disagreeing with a lot of the, the classes and the teachings mm -hmm. of the school mm -hmm. because I'm a stubborn kid and sorry to all my teachers. <laughs> But I, I ended up just being bored, right? I was bored throughout yeah. the entire second year. So at some point I set up a project and I said, I'm going to find the best students in the school and I'm going to make a commercial game. And at this point, Xbox Live Arcade was sort of the big thing in game development. So I said, okay, I'm gonna make I'm gonna make an Xbox game. So I got the best students together and I ended up with a team that was just genuinely way too big. Right. This this project was doomed to fail from the start. At the same time it sort of showed that I had the capacity to bring together people around a common cause. And we started working on this game, created uh, a management structure 
made progress and actually got to the point where we got to pitch it to Xbox Live Arcade and they were interested in in talking about it. And that was the point where the school stepped in and said that anything that was created at school or using school hardware was the school's property. (laughs) And they shut down the project. And the reason they shut down the project was that I picked all the best students to work on it. Right, everybody that they had hopes for for the external projects that they do in the internship years and in the fourth years um, ended up wanting to work on this project instead, and they could not, they could not lose all that talent to this project. So they shut it down, which I had promised the team that we were gonna that I would do whatever it it took, whatever I could meaningfully do to get the game done, and now I couldn't. So. I decided to quit school. Yeah, I mean, way to pick a fight with your school. Maybe unintendedly, but damn, dude. Yeah, it was it was not my intent. And I, I wish the school no, um, nothing ill, right? I've worked with them since. And the people that were in the way back then are gone now. And the people that were supportive back then have actually evolved this sort of um, this sort of situation into part of the curriculum that people can follow if they're like particularly entrepreneurial or they want to go independent, they can actually start doing that earlier in their school career, which is awesome. Yeah. It seems like something you might want to support as a school, right? Right. Yeah. Back then that was just not an idea to like, we're talking about 2010, right? Independent development was young. I mean, Mm -hmm. yeah, we had Fez and you know, that was upcoming and braid existed and super meat boy was there. But beyond that, the indies that were inspiring, were uh, Pixel with um, Cave Story or Nikujin or Warning Forever or those were the games people were talking about and the indie scene was twenty to thirty people, mm. you know, like you had uh, Cactus making weird games, you had uh, Terry Kavanaugh, you had like the sort of the old crew of independent gaming was was very small. So there wasn't much of a career and there wasn't much of an industry structure around it. There was no press that cared about indie games. There was no um, independent games programs. You had Xbox Live indie games, uh, Xblig. Uh, but that was basically tiny throwaway experiments, right? It was more game jam games than commercial products most of the time. So indie just kind of didn't exist so yeah school didn't support it uh exactly so you quit the second year this in the second year the project got shut down and one of the designers on the team was this kid that i absolutely just this like the strongest dislike i could put into words right but he was good i had met him uh, about a year and a half earlier and our first meeting was not great. We already didn't like each other straight away. He thought I was too business focused. I thought he was a hipster that just didn't care about actually, you know, doing this seriously. But he had convinced me he was a great designer with a prototype of his that he showed me a few months earlier. So when I was putting together this team, I got him on board. Right. His name was Jan Willem Nijman. And when I dropped out of school, he was the only other person who was dropping out and it was not because of me it was not because of the project he didn't care too much about the project he just had fun trying to figure out if this was something interesting and i realized that i'm really good at you know putting things together bringing a game from all the things i'd made from the sort of uh, bigger games that i'd worked on as that sidekick on those earlier games i'd learned to work with teams i'd learned to how to communicate with xbox life arcade i learned to communicate about money um and i knew how to finish a game i was a programmer right over the decades i'd become a a good programmer now jan willem he was an incredible designer right even at that age even when he was 20 uh, and he wasn't even 20 he was 19 i think he was an incredible designer just in a sense of uh, feedback, a sense of responsiveness, uh, a feeling to his games that is, uh, you know, not something you come across very often in designers. Mm -hmm. And he's really good at starting things, but everything he released was a prototype that got thrown away after two days and then released with the idea of, "Eh, I'll just put it out there, right? So he realized he couldn't finish things, and I realized I couldn't start things. And we both were suddenly out of a school, 
and without much of a path in life. So we decided that he had this little prototype called Crates from Hell. And we decided that we would release it on Xbox Live Arcade. So we started working on that. We called the company Vlambeer. And we we got started on on trying to do that. And then as we were going, we realized that Super Crate Box was not going to be large enough for Xbox Live Arcade, that we didn't have enough of a fan base to release a commercial game. So we pivoted to making Super Crate Box our business card and made a flash game called Radical Fishing to make some money. And that's really where things started. The idea was to make one or two games and then have enough money to continue with our life. Right, not have to work together ever again, <laughs> and uh, instead we uh, we lasted as a company for uh, exactly a decade. Wow! And um, of course, you made uh, you made um, Nuclear Throne, right? Uh, I, I guess your most most well known uh, title. Can we talk a little bit about? Um, about indie games you mentioned it before that you started at a time where there wasn't really a space for that um what's uh well i i guess i kind of know but i want to hear it from you what's the what's the state of indie games now it seems like they're a, a good bit more important and it seems like you played a part in that right i mean i don't know like i was at the right place at the right time I think. But what I will say is that independent development has obviously become sort of the foundational structure of games over the past decade, that it has gone from sort of a fringe that enthusiasts would check to probably the games that people play most over time. Uh, there's a lot of really high quality indie games and we don't even separate you know, in most award ceremonies, we don't really have an indie award anymore because Indie games just stand toe to toe with these huge AAA productions, right? I think what happened over the past decade is is extremely interesting in that you had a medium, you had this B sort of what do you call it, like B games? Yeah, you, you had AAA games, B games, and then you had experimental indie stuff, right? That was where it started, right? Indie got more serious, it got more commercial, it got ways in to uh, commercialize, right? Uh, whether it was Flash, and then after Flash, it was uh, iOS and Steam, and then it kind of grew everywhere. As those developments happened, uh, the B games kind of got pushed out of existence because making games on a budget just didn't work anymore because you couldn't compete with the AAAs and you couldn't compete with the indies, not with the AAAs because of quality, not with the indies because of budget. So the B games industry just kind of disappeared and indie took over. Do you have some examples for like B games? I'm just trying to think uh, what 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 B games are. B games um, were like these these wonderful. I always thought of them as wonderful, but they were sort of like the discount version of big games, right? You would have um, you would have these these racing games, right? Big racing games, um, and then you would have the discount version of it. I don't remember what it was. Was it yeah, okay. battle racing instead of destruction derby? Yeah. And you had, instead of wipeout, you had killer loop. Um, okay. stuff like that, where it was just, it was clear that the games were trying to emulate something that was a trip away game, but just trying to do it on a budget. Yeah. 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 Okay. I get it. I have the picture now. It's like, like uh, games you get for a tenner in the supermarket, but right. on, on the weird. Pyramid yeah. They were always right. in that weird box in the corner of the store. Yeah. Or that, always the like green right. thing. Yeah. Seven, 70 discs thrown in a box. And you just kind of rummage <laughs> through and go like, ah, oh, this looks cool. Yeah, and then you would buy it for like nine guilders back in the day, and go home, and it was, it was, you know, not the greatest game you'd ever played, but it was really good entertainment usually. Yeah. yeah. So indie kind of pushed that out, and that left a, a pretty big vacuum for people who wanted to play games that weren't that expensive or even were a, a little different. Indie started as a counterculture, I think, or at least the, the generation of indie I'm part of started as mm. counterculture. It was a lot of Games being too big on presenting narrative set pieces instead of gameplay, 
right? A lot yeah. of the early indie was games should be games or games should be more interesting than trying to emulate movies. So over the years, it commercialized. I think I had a, a little part in that back Back in those days, uh, Flamber was one of the indies that was really serious about doing business and negotiating deals and earning money. And I remember back in those days, wanting to have a Rami on your team was like, that was, a, that was just a thing people said. Like, I wish I had a Rami on my team. Oh, that's um, nice. It was cute. Uh, it was also a little scary. Um, but yeah, no, the idea of somebody who would handle business and marketing uh, on top of being a programmer, that was really appealing to a lot of indies. But a lot of indies just ended up being good at it themselves. And there were always the people that were kind of a bit of both. You had Alexander Bruce working antechamber. Um, you had um, Brian uh, working on releasing games on like 30 SKUs. Yeah, you, you know, everybody was kind of doing their own thing. And there were a few people that were serious about the business. And there were a few people that were not. Um so as things grew, Flamber always ended up being in that weird spot where we were one of the more commercially successful studios that was also rapidly releasing games, right? We released Super Crate Box. Right after that, we were on Serious Sound, The Random Encounter with Devolver Digital, one of their first published games. Uh, we, were in their, we were in their initial indie reach out. Flamber was one of them. Um, we connected Devolver with Hotline Miami, which ended up being sort of one of the defining hits for for Devolver that they then used to catapult themselves to, you know, incredible heights. Just a very impressive story. Um, we ended up being one of the first Apple games that got Apple indie games that got an Apple Design Award um, and Apple Game of the Year. Together with Greg Woolwind, who was one of the people who had, I think, already gotten one before for Solid Skier, and Zach Gage, who uh, was working on strange, interesting little games, but on iOS, mostly BitPilot stood out for us. And uh, we worked with Eirik Surka, I shouldn't forget to mention Eirik. Eirik Surka, who now is, is probably best known for the Spelunky soundtrack, but uh, did incredible music work on, on Ridiculous Fishing as well. So we were there. Then Luftrousers, we were early. We helped sort of figure out what indie on PlayStation looked like with the help of uh, Shahid Kamal, who uh, was really pushing and pioneering indie uh, at PlayStation, uh, signed our deal on the back of a of a coaster for a cup at a at a bar or a pub, or we were having a we were having food somewhere. I think both of us don't drink, so it was. You know, not drinking that way, but just like a tea or something. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, from there, Twitch started becoming a thing. Flamber was one of the first on Twitch. We were the first studio ever, I think, to sell our game on Twitch because I hacked. Well, hack is a big word, but I, you know, like hack as in duct tape together. I duct taped together the Twitch API with a, a Steam code release. So anybody who would subscribe to our channel would get a Steam code. So every time... Things were happening. For me, part of the business of Lambert was always to have an interesting business case. Right. So we were not just experimental in our game design. We were experimental in how we tried to sell our games, how we tried to promote our games. And we live streamed on Twitch uh, our development for three and a half years, every Tuesday, every Thursday, while selling our game on Twitch. Just deciding that it would be a good idea, you know, to sell the game where people were following news about the game. Uh, which ended up defining a lot of of that culture as well. So I don't know, yeah, like it, certainly unique. Uh, that was something that uh, I worked at Twitch for four years, and I think uh, your channel always had a unique um, price on subs. You had like seven ninety nine or something, and then um, yeah, you 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 would get the game with the sub, and and these are things that were totally unheard of for developers, <laughs> and I, I'm not even sure to what degree that exists today. But that was so ahead of its time. Uh, right. We, that, we, that it was just uh, just looking at the channel was like, what? Like seven ninety nine or whatever it was, was like yeah. always stood out. It was good to see. Good to yeah. see, yeah. So yeah, it's not that, you know, and then in the meanwhile, there were things like I created press kit because I got bored of making press kits and that ended up being the de facto standard for press kits in the entire games industry. Uh, by accident, I didn't mean to do that. I actually made it for myself and then 
Phil Tabatowski at Young Horses, who you might know from Octodad and uh, Bug Snacks, was one of the people I was asking feedback from, including, you know, there were people in the press that I was asking feedback from. Uh, but Phil said, can we use this as well? And I cleaned up the code and just went, oh, I'll release it for public. And then it became the standard. And I started traveling. I started doing this public speaking thing by accident. And it started as a necessity. I was in the Netherlands and the Dutch games press reaches 15 million people. I love all of them, but yeah, that's not enough people to sell games. Um, so I had to go to London and the only way to get there with no money as school dropouts was to do public speaking. That was the only way I could think of that anybody would pay for me to go to London is if I could give a talk or a presentation. So I started doing the public speaking thing. My talks ended up being very successful. I think I hit sort of a balance between business mindedness and creativity that was useful. And it meant that um, that before long, I was traveling all around the world to give speeches, right? Uh, I ended up in San Francisco because of uh, IGF award. Uh, Jan Willem and I went there for Super Crate Box. And I started speaking more and more. And at some point, I started getting all these invitations from places that I just, I hadn't even considered that there was game development there, right? Like uh, getting invitations from South America and North Africa and Asia of just like, can, can you, I saw your talk on YouTube. Could you come speak to our developers here? And I was just like, I, can you afford to fly me there? And they would always go like, no, we're, we're like four people. We don't, we don't have money. And I was like, I don't have money either. So uh, if you ever have money, let me know. And sometimes there'd be a university that could pay for it. But most of the times I'd have to say no. So when Ridiculous right. Fishing came out and Flyber suddenly made, you know, a, a frankly absurd amount of money. Um, I asked John Willem if I could spend some of that on going to all of those places and, and talking to all of those developers. And that's what kind of kicked off my my travel career, I guess, where I just went around the world. And every time I would go somewhere, I would learn unique solutions to particular problems. And I would be able to relay unique solutions that I'd seen somewhere else for problems people were having. And as it went, that network became bigger and bigger until... I was probably, I don't know, like, I don't, who would be the most, would I be the most internationally connected developer in the world? I have no idea, but I must have been close, right? Mm. Um, in terms of personal connections. Yeah, so point to answer. Mm. I, I just tried to help and I kept trying to help um, for as long as I, you know, for as long as I could. And uh, now with COVID, I've shifted it to digital a bit, but uh, that's kind of how I ended up being who I was, right? There was just, I was reaching a lot of people. And because of that, I think a lot of companies that were looking at figuring out their indie strategy or figuring out their procedures or their deals for independent developers ended up talking to me because I was in the, I was talking to a lot of them. But I also understood the business and the realities of of the industry. So I was just the right person at the right place at the right time. I don't think I did anything particularly special there. Um, I do think that me being raised Dutch Egyptian really helped in my decision to to focus on these emerging territories, to focus on these places that I felt were just underrepresented entirely in games. For uh, sure. And I, I would suggest we talk about that more in, in part two. I think you uh, tied up the story very beautifully. And I think it's very inspiring to see... You kind of said, yeah, yeah, nothing special. And I, I totally get that. I think it's just uh, what we see a lot with uh, this kind of, let's say, talent or ability stack where just uh, if you're just a developer, uh, that's one thing. But if you're a business-minded developer, okay, now you've got something. If you're a business-minded developer who can tell a story, now you've got more. And if you are also, like you said, and we will get uh, more into that in, in our second half, um, who look who is particularly interested in um, non let's say mainstream territories now we've got four things stacked upon each other that make a very unique mix and i i guess that would be my kind of mirror back to you my explanation for um well that that clearly must lead to something right um so yeah that that would be well thank you for that story first and foremost and um well would you would you agree with my assessment? I don't want to just I, put it there as a as an I, absolute. I think so. I think there. 
I think the thing with being a developer is being only a developer will never be good, right? Like you have to be a developer with an interest and whether that is being business minded or uh, liking art or be, being into literature or whatever it is, whatever the, the additional uh, is, I think just being one thing in any creative field will, will lead to stagnation. And it's, it's a fine place to start. I was a programmer at, at the start with minimal extra interests, but as you grow, you have to evolve other interests. And I think business is one of them. But again, like Jan Willem, uh, my, my former co-founder of Lambeer, he's a, he's a game designer. And he, has, um, he was pretty single focus when we met at being a game designer. And he's grown his influences uh, tremendously over, over the decade. But that is also fair. I think as long as you don't... The, I guess what I'm trying to say is the most boring games, in my opinion, get made by people who only take inspiration from games, right? And gotcha. finding yeah. a balance between the game design part of games and the inspiration slash influences part of games, I think that's what makes beautiful things. No doubt about it. I would like to ask you um, uh, for the end of this segment a couple of questions uh, quick fire questions yes see what go see what comes to mind um first one obligatorily important what games are you playing right now or what games are on your watch list or what has impressed you in recent times open question what what games have uh entered the brain of rami uh recently right uh i've been um I've been playing Flight Simulator a lot, like a, a absolutely ridiculous amount. I fly long haul flights, intercontinental. I do proper like briefings and everything. It's it's gotten out of hand tremendously. I've been um, I've been so impressed by the fact that all of Earth, in a recognizable way, is in a video game, and it's just it's a completely new way of thinking of what we can do with games. Right with the cloud, with streaming technology, with stuff like that. Um, I continue to play Destiny. I don't think I will ever tire of that game. I just finished the new raid in that game, the six-player end game activity, and it's just it's such a tour of the force by the Bungie team. Like uh, highlight after highlight, beautiful, evocative moments, challenging, puzzling um, scenarios. Uh, you know, very tight gunplay as you'd expect from Bungie. Um, I've been playing Post Void again, which is this little indie FPS that uh, I will have to warn everybody who wants to check it out that, you know, strongly flashing graphics. Um, but this beautiful condensed version of a FPS that, you know, might remind people of Devil Daggers, another minimalist uh, first person shooter. I'm trying to get better at that. I'm honestly, quite frankly, terrible at it. And then uh, I picked up Hitman, and Hitman has been just incredibly impressive i finished the dubai level and the the opening level and the level after that and the versatility of of io interactive just never ceases to amaze me fantastic uh next question right away what's your favorite event uh seemingly uh, you know long in the past now um <laughs> maybe or maybe there's something current for um for business um, slash for hanging out? And uh, what do you have maybe a little uh, story about something? I mean, I think at, at this point, my favorite, like there, there's always been a lot of interesting events. And I think, you know, depending on what you want out of your business, there's different events that are interesting, right? If I want to just hang out, figure out what is happening in the industry, learn what people are talking about, if I want to do that at sort of the, the corporate end of the industry, I would go to a DICE in Vegas. If I want to figure it out sort of across the industry, including indies, I might go to a reboot. You know, if I want to figure out what's happening in Europe, there's the, there's, uh, you know, the events during Berlin Games Week. If I want to figure it out in Australia, just GCAP. Like the, the industry has gotten so big that depending on what your goals are and where you're looking, there's a good event for any place. Uh, so it's hard to say what my favorite events. Are. I've always appreciated the sort of chillness of Reboot. So maybe, maybe Reboot Develop? I don't know. It's it's hard to pick. 
Un understandable. It's, uh, I'm just thinking about the question. Maybe asking for the for a favorite isn't um, fair. Uh, so, <laughs> it's, hard, yeah. it's hard with so many events that are good for so many different reasons. For sure. Um, this is, of course, the GamesNet Berlin Europe podcast. And um, again, asking for a favorite. But what is your favorite memory connected to Berlin? I mean, that must probably, I mean, uh, probably amaze. Um, or the, there was, in 2011, there was the, Ber what was it, Big Jam. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the Berlin Independent Games Jam, I guess. Um, it was in a little cafe on, God, Karls, what was it, Karlsplatz? Is that a thing? That's possible. Yeah, a tiny cafe there. It was one of my first international trips, right? Uh, I'd been to Cologne for Gamescom because that was my first ever my first ever event, and then I had gone to San Francisco for GDC. I'd been to London for that talk, and then I just went to a jam in Berlin, and it just sounded like such a ridiculous idea, right? To get in a train for six hours to a foreign country to make video games for two days. I, I thought I was out of my mind and I had the best time I can possibly imagine. Met a lot of great people. Um, a lot of people that I'm still friends with or close friends with to this day. Uh, and it was just, it was the first time I felt part of that international sphere because you have to remember Jan Willem in, in, in Flamber was the indie. I was the business guy. I was, I was the, I was the suit. So Getting to feel part of the community on my own terms was was really really nice, and I think uh, Big Jam was a big part of that. And so, prob probably that. That's awesome, and I'm sure the people who were there and uh, remember that uh, will will uh, have a fond memory as well. Rami, thank you very much uh, for your insights. Time is flying, and uh, we will hear each other again in part two of this conversation. Very much looking forward uh, to it. Where we speak more about your your influences as a person, how you grew up, and all that. So let's stay tuned for that. Thanks for listening to part one of this episode. Be sure to also check out part two, which will be released two weeks after part one on all podcast platforms. So it might already be out by the time you hear this. Whatever platform you're on, subscribe or follow the GamesNet Berlin Europe podcast to listen to many more insightful conversations with fantastic games industry guests from Berlin and from all over Europe. Thank you very much and see you very soon. Bye bye. Hi there. Before you go, this is Florian, project manager for GamesNet Berlin Europe. If you want to stay connected to the network, find out more about upcoming events and links to other MediaNet initiatives, you can visit us at gamesnetberlin.eu and subscribe to our newsletter. Thank you so much for listening to our podcast and until next time.